It's not about me or trying to communicate some sort of dogmatic idea. If anything, it is a way to make me disappear and the universe just takes over. That's why my art is about natural forces. I just want to disappear. Sabri Benashur is a wizard of ceramics. Using natural forces like magnetism and chemical crystallization, he creates pieces that look absolutely extraterrestrial. We spent several days with Sabri, capturing his intricate creative process and exploring the philosophy behind his art. I emigrated to the US when I was, I think, four, and we moved to Missouri. My mom was always looking for things for us to do, to keep us out of trouble. And there was a woman named uh, Naomi Powell. She was like, I think 64 when I started and I was like seven years old. In the evenings, if she saw kids like out at night, you know, she'd be like, this is too late for you to be out playing in the street. You're gonna have an art class now. And so she'd like bring them <laughs> and like, you know, teach them some art and, you know, call it, I guess, you know, call their parents and be like, hi, I'm, your kids are in an art class right now. She taught pottery in her basement. She would bring things bring other people in to teach weaving or writing or puppet making or whatever. She had this vision of providing uh, art education to people who would not have otherwise had access to it. No, I tried a bunch of stuff. There's a juggling class one time, um, but you know, the ceramics is what stuck with me. The relationship to the clay is very direct. Right. Um, and it also has a science angle, which I've always been into my whole life. What I'm doing right now is called centering, which is getting the clay centered so it's not lurching all over the place and flailing around. I could turn this into a vase or something, but I'm going to do something a little different. I grew up mostly in Missouri, and then, um, you know, parents' work takes you different places. But I ended up in, in D.C., uh, where I apprenticed under a woman named Jill Hinckley at her studio. When I first showed up there, I had a bowl, and I was like, here, this is a bowl that I made. This is mm -hmm. the best bowl that I made. And she was like, if that's the best bowl that you've made, you have some work to do. <laughs> <laughs> if you compare the levels that you came in and then when you were out of the apprenticeship. Night and day, I mean, tremendous difference. Yeah, I went in there, tallest thing I made was like this tall and weighed yeah. 10 pounds. And then after that, I was, you know, throwing giant things. Uh, not that larger is better. Is the shape aesthetically pleasing? Um, does it do what it's supposed to do? Does it pour if it's a teapot? You know, right. does it actually work as a mug? Does the handle not hurt you? And then there's, of course, the artistic side, which is not as easily quantifiable. I mean, someone can have, you know, a vision that they express through sculpture or ceramics or... This is a recipe that I came up with after a lot of experimentation. But what I like about this slip is how it dries and how it cracks. Wabi Sabi finds its origins in a form of Buddhism, which emphasizes the impermanence of material things, the beauty in imperfection. Things don't have to be perfectly symmetrical in order to be beautiful, and that sort of off-kilteredness of it um, imparts, ironically, a kind of balance. Sometimes you just need to let go and let things take their course. Describe the sources of inspiration and what's the, probably what's the biggest of them? Any time, any time I see something in nature that you can sense a force behind it, a force directing it, that could be eroded sandstone, it could be root growth, it could be the underside of a lily pad, it could be any number of things and not just the way things grow but also the way things decay because sometimes when things decay they also reveal an order and a force yeah. to that. So a crystal can grow one way, yeah. for example, and then be naturally, you know, over tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of years, it can also 
degrow in a different way. It can be etched naturally when conditions change, revealing an entirely different pattern and entirely different structure. I look for sources of growth and sources of decay, any sign of a force behind it. And then I think, how can I replicate that somehow? I saw a sedimentary stone on some trip. I was like, how can I create that erosion effect? And I mean, I literally exploded clay. I dried clay. I sandblasted clay. I just did everything I could think of to try and capture that. These are questions that I think about over years. They just kind of tumble around in the back of my mind and I will learn something new yeah. and something will click and I'll say, oh, let me try this, let me try this. So some of these things, you know, I remember my moment of inspiration was 20 years ago and it might have gone, 10 years might have gone by before I figured out, oh, wait, this is how I can do that. These are fun problems to solve and sometimes I'll think about them when I go to sleep. This uh, brown stuff that you see, this is what you call a luster. This is a kind of resinous substance that has uh, gold and other precious metals sort of suspended in it. It doesn't look like it now, but when it gets fired in the kiln, all of the organic materials will burn off and it will leave a thin coat of actual gold alloy on the surface. So when it comes out, it should be like nice and shiny and gold looking. We are at uh, Greenwich House Pottery. Uh, it's where I teach pottery um, and it's also where I make uh, some of my stuff. It's a huge place. They've been around for, like I said, more than 120 years. Lots of talented people come through here. It's kind of an amazing place. And uh, I'm very lucky to be teaching here. It's what not... What is it? Hmm? What is it? It's a slip recipe that I made that crackles like this. Oh, you made it yourself? Mm-mm. Good. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I think, I, I mean, I rode my bike, so I'll just take it on my bike. So I can just pop them off anytime. I fold this up to the ceiling to make space. Oops. My mom signed me up for pottery classes when I was probably seven. And I think it was around the same time that I picked flowers for my mom and put them in water and noticed that some of them grew roots. And so I was like, oh my God, that's amazing. And so I started picking everything and trying to grow roots. So that's just been a lifelong hobby. So this is a curry leaf tree if you like break the leaves. You can smell, it smells kind of like curry. Uh, I grew this one from a seed like literally 12 years ago. Um, this one is kind of a not very common plant. It's a uh, huperzia. It grows in trees and that, you know, hangs down. This one too. Oh, this is one of my favorites. It's just so out of control. It's growing from the top over there. And uh, every year it gets longer and longer. Um, this is a tr tree dwelling cactus that lives in the trees in like Brazil um, and just hangs down. How do you take care of them? They are all different. They are all different and they each have different uh, watering needs. So in here there's a terrarium. The difficult ones are in the terrarium, but then the others, I mean, these tubs are full of water and these are pumps that I can control from my phone because I would spend my entire day watering these goddamn plants. This is my array of um, super magnets in here. So they're sort of stacked on top of each other. They were calibrated to sort of maximize uh, the magnetic field. This is, was one of the first ones I made. You know, sometimes the they come out kind of cool looking. I just kept this around. I, it's, it's, you know, it's not quite what I would do today, but at least the results were interesting. Um, and then sometimes the results are awful. So like, this one literally grew hair. It grew hair. It's so disturbing to look at. I can't even look at this. This makes me want to throw up. So I'm going to rip this apart later. This one I kind of left for a little too long. 
and my solutions had gotten contaminated. You have to create the conditions for it to grow and you can guide how it grows, but the specifics, it's gonna do what it wants to do. Elevate this a little bit to get it in the magnetic field. So this is only being held, you know, in place by the magnetic field. If I take it out, it's going to liquefy immediately. So let's see. Oh, it might not want to leave. So now when I put it back, it's not gonna go back to how it was. I have to build it again, yeah. Seeing what the universe can do when given the right conditions makes you feel small in a sense because you're looking at a force that's bigger than you. You're looking at a force that's older than you and you, you become small in a sense. And I think that's important. I think we should, in some sense, feel small to know that we are a part of something much bigger. Some art will communicate feelings about people or the world, or, you know, they'll explore um, questions about the human condition. If I'm being perfectly honest, uh, the reason why I make the art that I make is is because uh, humanity is exhausting. I don't I don't want to talk about heartache and heartbreak. I don't I don't want to talk about foolishness that we do to ourselves. I want to escape that, and so that's why I look for natural processes. I look for art that unfolds somewhat on its own. I mean, I think there's sometimes like a a vanity in each of our daily lives thinking, you know, th this work thing is so important. Drama, you know, among friends, uh, how I present myself to the world. There's uh, almost a, a, a vanity in focusing on that. And that's, I just, I want to get away from that. That's why my art is about natural processes. That's why my art is about natural forces. I just want to disappear. I can already foresee comments like about vanity, says the guy who's jacked, who's gorgeous. <laughs> and how do, you, how do you embrace the process of your own getting old? I cannot believe you have asked that. Especially in the gay community, we emphasize superficial looks. They're currency. You find yourself investing in them, and it is building it's a building a castle on sand because it will go away when you least want it to. These are the things that are going to fade with time and you have to let go of them. And you have to, you know, enjoy the ride while you can, but invest in some things that will last, you know. And for me, creativity in art is something that will last. And maybe when my hands are too shaky to make anything spectacular and all I can do is a little bowl, I don't care. That will be enough for me. Nothing in my years has taken this much work. The full sculpture is made out of 144 different individual pieces. And originally it was actually going to be 230 individual pieces. And I actually made all 230, but then I didn't like 70 of them. I had to do some 3D design on the computer. 3D printed it, but 3D printing is super expensive. So I just 3D printed like two individual pieces like this, you know, in resin. And then I had to replicate it. So then I made silicone molds of the 3D print. And then I made resin replicas of those. And I made a bunch of those replicas. And so then I made plaster molds of those replicas and then started casting individual piece in clay. And all this I was doing in my bedroom, by the way. There was silicone everywhere, there was plaster dust everywhere. Uh, it was a mess. And I would do that every single day. I would be work, gym, stay up until midnight or one or whatever, working on this stuff for months, 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 months. It was like that, I had no social life. And then I had to assemble it together. And it might look like it fits together perfectly and easily, but it was logistically very hard to get it all to come together because one little change you know on this 
uh, on this side affects this side. Any imperfections get magnified and shift everywhere. One of my favorite things I've ever made, not because I think it's like awesome, but I think, um, you know, when you pour your heart into something, mm -hmm. it starts to mean a lot to you. We are in the uh, Lauren Marsh showroom in Murray Hill. This is where uh, a lot of my ceramics goes on sale here. A friend contacted me out of nowhere and said, oh, hey, they might like your stuff here. You should come by and bring it. And I was like, oh, can I? So I just showed up with a backpack full of pottery mm -hmm. and uh, you know, was like, hi, do you like any of this? And they were like, yeah, we do. I would say to someone just starting out, you know, be confident in yourself and go out there and try. The worst that can happen is someone can say no or get out. <laughs> Did it grow upside down? It grew in just about every direction that you can imagine. Um, I changed it around many, many times. Do you peek at them when they grow? Oh my God, yeah, I'm always, look, every day. Oh my, multiple times a day, <laughs> multiple times a day. I'm always looking in there, poking them, making sure, look, that one doesn't look like it's growing very well, so maybe I'll cover it, yeah. maybe prevent it from growing. Um, I'm constantly micromanaging them. It is relentless. Um, like, I know that I like let, quote unquote, like let these processes happen as they happen. That's true, but I'm also constantly intervening and poking and prodding and like nudging them is like, is that strong enough? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it's almost, it's a borderline obsessive. Yeah. I like to think of these bowls as holding more than like a general purpose object. So if you look into it, you can see sort of motion. And so I feel like, you know, this is a bowl that captures motion, physicality, movement. It might look like it's gonna transport you somewhere. The whirls, whirlpools are gonna suck you in. Let's say 200 years from now, someone sees one of the pieces in some rich man's, woman's collection. What do you want them to think? I want them to think that hundreds of years ago, someone looked at the natural world and found beauty in the same way that I do now, hundreds of years in the future. How long do you think to continue this? I will never stop. I, w I will never stop. As long as my hands can hold clay, I will never stop.